All right, we're live. Uh, great to have you guys all here. I'm going to try to give uh, Manuel a mic as well. Let's see if we know how to do that. Okay, so I've invited him to come on stage. I think that will work. Um, but yeah, so the topic for today is the uh, question of, are you becoming a robot? And what do we mean by that? So in the AI world right now, there's a really two very different pushes um, that are in the news a lot, right? One is the urge to get cars to self-drive, to get AI to make our lives better. But there's this other urge too, which is how to sort of market and monetize. And, and that's being done on social media. It's being done on uh, many different forums. Um, and it's having a huge impact, right? And so we wanted to take some time and start to think about uh, whether AI is actually enabling us and empowering us or whether it is instead, um, in, in some ways, uh, making us more like machines, more like a robot, right? Um, and so, you know, we have a few questions in front of us. I was going to take just a little bit of time to allow each of you to introduce yourself. So, Julie, why don't we start with you? Okay, hi, I'm Dr. Julie Marble. I am the executive director for the Institute of Experiential Robotics at Northeastern University. Um, I have been working in robotics and autonomous systems for 20 years uh, with David, among others. Um, my interests are in computational theory of mind and trust of AI and trust of autonomy. So how do we know whether or not we can rely on these systems and how do they understand us? And I'm very glad to be here. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Alex, you want to go next? Uh, sure, yeah. Alex Bates, uh, Managing Director at Neocortex Ventures and now um, CEO of a company called SkyMiner. And I guess my journey has been, um, I was co-founder and CEO of a company called Mtel, which brought machine learning into this IoT space of predicting when equipment would fail for large oil and gas companies trying to prevent things like the Gulf oil spill. And um, there was a big move towards autonomous rigs, for example. And it was interesting to see the journey towards autonomy and autonomous diagnosis of, you know, fault conditions. Um, certainly saw a lot of um, adoption and, and some positive things. And then also some areas where the human element ended up being the core to the overall solution. So I got really interested in this idea of augmented intelligence. Um, yeah, I look forward to the discussion today. All right, Mariana. Hello, I'm Dr. Mariana Todorova. I'm a futurist, researcher, professor at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, um, visionary strategies, blockchain decision-making platform inventor, former member of parliament and former advisor to the president of the republic. I'm also author of books. I have written two books recently. One is about ethical aspects of AI and the other is about counterfactual analysis as a forecasting tool. I was also a member of UNESCO Intergovernmental Special Committee for elaboration of recommendation of the ethics of AI. And I'm also part of ad hoc working group on foresight on emerging and future cybersecurity challenges connected with AI. So ethical aspects are the most important topic for me now of AI, and I'm trying to unravel them through a futuristic and humanistic perspective. And I'm very glad that uh, I'm here with uh, uh, neuroscientists because for me, it's also very important to address the question if AI should be anthropocentric or completely different. Excellent. Well, we're very privileged to have you with us. And last but not, uh, not least, uh, Agata, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, guys. My name is Agata. Um, I'm currently serving as a Presidential Innovation Fellow, um, specifically detailed to the Department of Transportation in helping serve in my extra capacity at both Veterans Affairs and Department of Transportation. 
Um, my academic background is very multidisciplinary um, in that I worked as an uh, AI researcher within the robotics field. And previously, I worked also in biomedical on uh, medical applications of engineering. Um, so where I am today and why I'm here is I've taken a turn about two years ago from being a researcher in more of lifelong learning. So how do we make our, our AI actually intelligent and moving into thinking about infrastructure and how do we set up a responsible infrastructure at an organizational level so that we can use AI responsibly. So if, for example, if we decide, hey, um, this algorithm is not doing what we intended, how can we change that and very quickly pull it or change it so that it behaves in the way that we want it? So with that, I'll pass the mic back to David. Yeah, real quick introduction for those of you who don't know me. Um, I've been doing you know autonomous driving and robotics for, I guess, 22 years now. It sounds crazy, uh, but I've developed autonomy for about 20 you know to to, to 25 different uh, kinds of robots, things like drones, trucks, buses, cars, military vehicles, um, all kinds of stuff. And right now, I'm working with the automotive world to develop uh, what we call measurable safety and a way to um, really understand what the impact of AI is on the roadway. Um, and that starts with a single car, actually. If we can't even do it for one car, how can we do it for uh, the roadway as a whole? And if we can't do it for the roadway, how do we do it for society, right? Um, all right, so let's launch right into it. Uh, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about echo chambers, right? Um, echo chambers is this concept that uh, part of what's happening right now in social media and with the internet is that you really find yourself surrounded by a lot of like-minded people. So you can share uh, your excellent ideas or your really crazy ideas and get a lot of reinforcement for them. Um, but to some extent, you feel like you're kind of trapped in this um, sphere, but you don't feel trapped. You feel actually wonderful, right? Because lots of people are agreeing with you. Um, but is that reality, right? And to what extent is this warping our view of reality? To what extent is it changing our ability to um, communicate more broadly. So I wanted to open that up for your thoughts. How is AI contributing to this concept of echo chambers? Do you think the AI can help? Do you think it's hurting? What are your thoughts? Yeah, maybe I'll jump in. I think um, it's a fascinating question and very timely. I think a lot of everyone's seen the social dilemma, you know, which talked about some of the, the issues with Facebook. And in AI, there's this term, the paperclip, problem where you over optimize paper clips and the whole universe turns into paper clips. And I don't think social media set out to sort of destroy the world, but I think it turned out that the way that they created this echo chamber turned into amplifying like in-group out-group behavior where, and sometimes the in-group could be around a cause like vaccines, or it could be around some tribal thing or even ethnic thing, but it ends up amplifying this sort of rage and hatred of the, uh, whatever other group is, where everything is confirmation that your group is right and that the other group are literally the most evil people on the planet. And I think it just amplifies this to create these rage mobs. Um, and I think the main ethical perspective, one thing I had was that uh, when this was discovered that engagement op optimized enragement, I think there was an active suppression of that information because it would destroy the advertising business model. So I think that was one takeaway was um, for me was there's a need for transparency so that when we discover these accidental issues that tap into maybe tribal, tribal or primal human behaviors, we need to find a way to course correct. Yeah, no, thanks, Alex. Um, any other uh, thoughts? I, um, yeah, the, the algorithms basically aim to generate more traffic to news with growing interest in them on the principle of uh, avalanche ball, and they want to increase the attention to ads or other important content. And therefore some social media, probably unconsciously, and it is unconsciously, encourages the hate speech or the so-called guilty pleasure. And in addition to that, the users receive more from the same of their searches and interests 
and thus uh, people become rigid in their views and uh, they lose uh, their critical thinking and this is the great contradiction because in the age of information abundance people are becoming more biased looking for shortcuts and heuristics being more in alternative facts and uh, fake news and probably the next big thing would be to neutralize this phenomenon on the internet and social internet space and now because i'm neighbor country of ukraine we are just over the black sea and i can follow the news both from ukrainian and russian side and the, the propaganda from russia is outrageous are uh, because now uh, we have some memorials dedicated to our uh, Russian deliberate uh, war uh, during the 19th century so people now are protesting and they want to remove these memorials in solidarity with Ukraine and uh, Russia uh, wrote in uh, their papers that uh, this is uh, a kind of invasion of uh, Ukrainian refugees so you you can see to what extend this fake news are becoming part of the warfare propaganda yeah it's a very timely uh comment um any other thoughts on on that question so one of the obvious sort of second questions in my mind is you know if ai has the ability to influence uh us in this really profound way essentially creating the the context of of what for us individually is the society around us right um then then the real question is who has control over that right and and so I'll throw out some some possibilities to some extent uh, and many of us in this have actually been programming ai right so we kind of know to what extent it does come down to code um is it the actual developer right is it the uh board of directors of facebook or the company that's doing the 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 paychecks for those developers um to what extent is the government playing a role um obviously we have someone on the panel who <laughs> is advising the federal government on this right now so so love to hear your thoughts um but but on the other hand to what extent is it is it the fault of of society for not doing a better job of creating the right um uh cross chain we've lost david so um but i i'll i'll go ahead and and start answering that question it's much like the echo effect this it's the question of control ends up being kind of um a sideways question because it wasn't initially done on purpose yes it's being leveraged now on purpose by these different agencies but one of the things that that we also know is that not only is there bias in the data that is being used to teach the algorithms thus yielding bias um in the outputs but there's bias in the in the math underlying the algorithms themselves and that bias is not even well understood by the mathematicians and programmers who are putting it who are putting these algorithms together so we end up with a case where it's not necessarily that someone's in control it's that um different people are or different organizations are more or less savvy about how to use these you know these these tools that are already in place and then when you add into that mix just how human cognition works and you know the rebound effect when someone an entrenchment when someone is provided with facts that oppose a deeply held belief they become even more deeply entrenched in that in that um that belief and you know the how do we oppose it well it appears that the only way to oppose that kind of entrenchment is through socratic discussion and we don't have ai or machine learning that can do that can produce that type of discussion and I'll I suppose I'll jump if in. If I may here. intervene, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Um, sure. Um, so I, I, I think it's very difficult to answer a question like this because I don't think that we really know what the correct engagement is. Should everybody get all information or should information be verified in many in, in the way that some countries are doing it or some companies are doing it. And I think my opinion is really that um, is that this can be ever changing. And I think that as a society, as we grow as individuals, we also grow as a society. And when I start to think about, you know, how I would implement this again, I'm, I like to think about Let's set up the flexible infrastructures that allow for us to change between these different engagement models. And so we can see, you know, if our society is in, in the, has the public mood that we should be seeing everything, then we allow for that infrastructure to allow the users to engage. And I think it really does come a little bit down to personal um, to personal preferences. However, as leaders in the field, it's really our responsibility to engage in a responsible way um, with the people that are using our algorithms and to let them know to understand your information might be filtered or know your information is not filtered. And then so perhaps I'll just leave it there and I'll pass the mic. Uh, if we are discussing the general control as a person with political experience too, I can say that control is really concentrated in one entity or organization and it is shared, it can be in a very narrow circle, but in case in AI, it is very impo important that all stakeholders have a clear understanding about what is it, because my experience shows me that governments uh, don't have completely understanding in technical aspects and parameters and also they are not aware of the risks and opportunities. And if I have to continue the statement of Julie about the biases, uh, the biases are reproduced by the data that uh, is uh, using to for AI to be taught. So uh, we can see a lot of uh, racial and uh, also gender biases, you know, about the uh, police department in a way that is using AI with uh, facial recognition to detect a certain uh, criminal on a specific spot in the in the city. So it always suggests first suggestions are that the possible criminals are black people or uh, Latinos, and when. Uh, some HR companies are using AI and they are requiring candidates for top management positions. DAI firstly uh, suggests uh, young uh, white males before females and etc. But this is uh, not a problem of the algorithms. This is problem of the data. So I know that of a lot of software developers are now putting their efforts to, to clear the data and to make it more neutral and objective. So I believe that we'll find the solution in these specific problems and niches. What is the biggest problem is that uh, people from different areas don't have a total understanding of what is AI and that we have now narrow artificial intelligence and probably that we'll have uh, artificial general intelligence and artificial super intelligence in 20 years and now the, that will be a game changer situation and we'll 
have to prepare now for for these new realities, especially when metaverse also uh, become a powerful tool. And if we allow AI to control these uh, metaverses and meta universes and to create its own spaces, and we can uh, describe so many various and different scenarios in that perspective. Yeah, that's a great point. So maybe I'll throw in one additional response here, um, starting with the sort of influence, whether it's like programmers or government or companies. Um, I think this AI is this fascinating thing where it used to be programmers wrote programs and it took in data and created outputs. But machine learning actually is curating data to train a system that then produces some kind of narrowly intelligent behavior and often with some emergent properties that weren't even necessarily programmed in. And so there's, in some cases, it's harder to even for programmers to always predict and understand what the, you know, the second order effects could be. And you brought up good examples where data itself was limited, which led to biased behaviors that weren't necessarily intention of the, you know, the, the machine learning data scientists, for example. So I think it, it, there's a lot of interesting implications for learning from data in general when the way you've always done things are, are now shifting because you have new emerging talent that aren't represented in the data you're training on and so on and how do you course correct for the limitations of data i think you also brought up you know the role of government and in particular not always understanding either the downside or the upside <laughs> i think that it is a dual problem you know you could over regulate and only look at the downside risk. And then the issue is there's still a pain and suffering that AI could actually help alleviate. But then the flip side, of course, is, um, you know, being aware, being aware of the, the upside opportunity and making sure you find the right strike, the right balance there. Um, I think, um, you know, governments, hopefully we do get more people like yourself advising that have the technical background. I think it tends to be, you know, missing for the most part uh, from people in, in government. But um, yeah, I think the other issue, of course, is with nation state competition, you know, for example, China versus some Western countries, it's unlikely that a unilateral self-regulation model would work where, you know, there's sort of covert projects happening that, um, so I think we have to kind of be, be practical. It's almost like with nuclear proliferation to think about how, you know, this next era, what could we do to maybe incentivize nation states to opt in? And, and personally, I'm a big fan of transparency because, with these emergent properties where it's hard to predict how things will go wrong, at least if there's transparency, when things do start to go off the rails, you know, we can brainstorm on ways to, to solve for that. But um, certainly an interesting challenge to think about. You know, it's, I, I like what you said, Alec. Um, one of the things that stands out to me with AI is that the way in which it solves a problem, the, the solution it comes to is is achieved in a completely different way than humans and my own research has has demonstrated this that you know what the machine learns is different than what the human learns and so when it gets to the point where you're asking the machine to collaborate with a human because it's solving the problem differently it is unable to collaborate because it doesn't have a way to connect on to to the human and so and when you add in to that mix the bias that's inherent in the data and the biases that are inherent in the algorithms, I begin to question you, know, are we, how can we create systems that can truly collaborate with us um, and help us achieve our ends? Can we actually create that beneficent um, machine that is actually working toward our, our end? And, and I sometimes seriously doubt it. Um, I do have a message from David. Uh, his web cage keeps crashing. Do we want to stay on this topic? Um, I have the list of questions and I can read a random question. You guys tell me what you'd like. Go on to another question. Okay. Um, based on what Alec just said, I, I'm going to jump to this one of the later questions. There's been a phenomenal increase in clinical anxiety uh, around the world. How have, how have artificial and artificial alternative facts contributed to this viral spread of anxiety and how has AI contributed to the viral spread? Could AI be used to limit this negative impact rather than contribute to it? And how should regulation play a role in diminishing this spread of anxiety?
anyone? I mean, the, the obvious thing to me is that, you know, we are hearing more and more about the bias and that's that's contributing to the anxiety. And it's I think it's an as an add on of the um, the echo chamber is that when you are dealing with depression, anxiety, stress, you are already cued, triggered, whatever word you want. Um, your brain is actually aligned to look for those things anyway. And then you have an AI that's feeding you information on social media that fits with how how you're working. Um, it is an intriguing question to ask, okay, if you are in the midst of depression or anxiety, if the AI starts feeding you things that counter that, like, uh, I don't know, pictures of kittens, could it, uh, could it improve you? Uh, and David is asking for the mic. Yeah, I wonder if um, he has to also be in to get the mic. David, are you there? Oh, <laughs> we had a brief appearance. Maybe I'll just quickly answer while we're, David's going to get in here as well. Um, I think you brought up really good examples. There's this term, term doom scrolling about, you know, scrolling through negative news. Some, I've caught myself, especially during COVID, doing it at like midnight and, oh, look, feed me the bad news. And, 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 you know, everyone knows the saying, if it bleeds, it feeds. And there's this inherent bias towards negative news. But I think these smartphones and, and apps amplify that to a crazy degree and make it seem like it truly, the world the sky is constantly falling. And and it, I can, for sure, it makes sense that anxiety is skyrocketing. You're stuck at home. Now all you can do is sit there looking at news in your phone and it just gets worse. And on top of that, I think we're such social creatures that all this distancing has probably been, you know, really negative psychologically, especially for kids. So hopefully, you know, that will start to improve. But in the short term, I optimistically, I hope this maybe increased investment in, in some in mental health solutions, maybe even neurostimulation, a shift away from conventional pharmacological solutions, whether it's, you know, brain stimulation or just, you know, even potentially plant-based medicines. But I think it's it's a looming crisis. I think that we have to really uh, keep an eye on. I think to your point, it's it's um it's a huge issue right now. Um, so uh, I do agree with both of your statements, and I think that this uh, echo chamber phenomenon also helps um, for us to live in the age of the post truth, uh, where there is no single universal truth, but many truths that proliferate and are comfortable for for a specific issue. And we can see that people are always are divided to several groups. They don't support one single opinion. They are always fighting and the, the statements are polarized. And that's why recently I wrote an article that in the near future, it will be very difficult to, to govern the societies in political aspect because we have so many different heterogeneous groups with different interests and causes and we could not combine these interests in one common thing and we even could hardly convince people that they can share one truth one statement and i predict that uh, this might be one of the big issue of the future of democracy and how we are going to cope with that that's why in some countries we we see some soft authoritarian regimes and uh, governance and we are in the this critical situation to look for new decisions and uh, i dedicated some of my works to the so-called liquid or delegative democracy as a new tool for governance but of course this is this is not enough but our uh, algorithms, social media, alternative uh, uh, facts actually are making the, the problems bigger and they don't provide decisions. So, uh, and the anxieties, anxiety also uh, grows. 
so our, our I don't believe that we'll be capable to uh, to make the so-called benevolent AI that will that would be uh, capable to uh, find uh, fake news, alternative facts, because this semantic uh, content is uh, very complex for the current uh, uh, capabilities of AI to to divide between what is true and what is false and what is uh, real and what is uh, fake. So uh, the situation is really very complicated. Or maybe just add that um, one last thought, which is and maybe Julie might respond to my thought um, here. But I think, you know, when we think about how we present information, we never really know how it's going to hit an audience. If you think about comedians, one joke works, totally kills one audience, and then they tell the same joke the next night to a different audience and it totally fails flat. And so now we're left with a, you know, this this concept of should we get to know our audience before we present information? And a lot of the social media companies have gone in this way. So let me figure out if I can predict if my audience or my user is in a state of anxiety. And so then I can change the information that I present. And or you can say, let's go the opposite way and say, in general, this piece of information brings anxiety. However, how do you do that without the interaction with the user? And I think this is where we really start to have a lot of dilemmas within, you know, both social media and the control of information. Because I think for the most part, everybody wants to bring good to the world, except it good just hits a different way for each population. And I'm going to pass the mic back to Julie because I know that she's done some work in this area. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I think, you know, I've been thinking about this quite a bit lately, but, you know, we're using... We have this drive in our country. If there's a you see it um, around the world to apply AI and machine learning everywhere. Um, and it's it's the old joke about you know everything is a nail if you have a hammer, and not everything is appropriate for AI and machine learning. And we started off you know developing some of the greatest the strongest AI and machine learning algorithms with respect to social media, because we wanted to be able to tailor people's experience. But is that really the best place to be using um, AI? I mean, really, if social media, should it not be more like standing in a crowd um, and you can search, you know, you want to know more about, um, I don't know, what people are posting for dinner lately, you can say, I want to know what people are posting for dinner lately and let it shoot, you know, and have it help you sort those, those people out rather than tailoring what is sent to you. Um, and, and it all goes back to that, like you said, Agata, about how you present information, it, how you present information when you present information um, and the sequence of information that is presented definitely affect how people interpret what is being told to them. And we are ceding that, that responsibility to machines that really want to, um, well, sell more sneakers or whatever happens to be popping up on my, my LinkedIn feed, or not my LinkedIn feed, my, my Facebook feed or, or wherever. So, um, yeah, and it and it goes back to the machines are solving the problems differently and sol and actually solving different problems than we are actually asking them to solve.
It looks like David and posted. And I don't a- remember when we end. Do we end at 1230 or do we end at 1? Because we're over if we do. I thought it was at f- 15 after um, okay. my calendar. So I guess okay. seven minutes. Okay. Um, do you want me to read another question off of our list of questions? Okay. Um, let's see. We, uh, how do we, how, <clears throat> I'll go here. Um, how do we infuse an ethical framework into the function of AI to lit harmful AI influence? Kind of thoughts on that? Maybe. I can't I'll jump in on this one. Oh, oh, sure. Uh, oh. Okay, so uh, this is perhaps the most important issue that we need to address now. Uh, And of course, uh, if we're discussing artificial neural intelligence, the things are are somehow understandable. And you are completely right that uh, uh, the solution that AI is providing to specific uh, uh, problems is different than uh, our, but uh, it could uh, it could be useful because we can contribute. For example, in in uh, some uh, wall or uh, discussing the due diligence that AI is making is quite faster than uh, some. Uh, um, lawyers can do, and they can um, save some uh, uh, hundreds of hours for more creative uh, job. Or uh, we can um, provide the genome sequencing to AI and to find different uh, to find different uh, illnesses. And this is all of help. But when we are discussing the possibility of self-emerging, co-emerging of uh, artificial general intelligence uh, that will be equal to us or will surpass us or will have the same cognitive abilities or uh, its own will or its own goals and consciousness uh, because uh, we have to discuss the consciousness since it's the most important, one of the most important things that we have. we have to discuss how we would be able to to teach uh, the AI of universal human values. But the problem is that we don't have a global human ethic uh, because we are part of the Western world, but we are different from the East, from the Arabic countries. And uh, general artificial intelligence will affect all the humanity. And probably an uh, uh, organization like a UNESCO or some huge organization like the United Nations uh, could uh, start this kind of discussion to uh, elaborate a minimum global ethical framework that is acceptable to different countries, religions, civilizations. Uh, and it could be codified as something as a base for uh, AI training in, in ethical aspects. But uh, at this moment, for me, this is not a realistic uh, task and it's knocking on the door. We don't have time to postpone it. So uh, probably uh, we as our stakeholders engage in AI should uh, advise these entities to to start such a discussion. So I'll jump in. Um, I've gotten a chance to work on creating and advising on several ethical AI frameworks um, during the course of my career. And I think, um, again, this is, I'm going to harp on on this point. Ethics is ever changing. And like you highlighted, it depends very much on the social group, the social time, the social mood. And so if you look at um, ethical frameworks, either, for example, OECD, um, who has developed an international ethical framework or their policing ethical framework, or in the trustworthy AI for the US, um, 
the executive order on trustworthy AI EO 859, I believe, you'll see that those principles that are outlined in the ethical framework are ones that are extremely difficult to understand if the algorithm is behaving the way that it is. So for example, um, under OECD, there are different risk levels for AI. And so instead, I think the, the way that the, the public mood is moving in this way is to say, if an algorithm has no influence on someone's life, then we have less uh, regulatory need to ensure that these things are being done, quote unquote, properly. But the higher the risk, and for example, OECD has hiring under risk level four under their highest level because that impacts someone's life. If you're using a, a, a higher platform to list a job posting and it is powered by AI to find candidates for you, well, frankly, it's going to have some kind of inherent bias under there. And it can be difficult, especially as a developer, to even know what the laws are. So, for example, um, using zip code as a feature is actually illegal. Um, and because it can be used as a proxy for race as a developer, how am I supposed to be familiar with these rules? So there are things I believe that can be done in terms of ensuring that our algorithms follow an ethical framework. However, I think in the larger picture, it can get very, very complicated. Um, so with that, I'll maybe pass back the mic to Julie since we're at time and she's kindly taken over for David and maybe <laughs> let her uh, do some wrap up. <laughs> Working with David for 20, for, you know, since, since 2000. So, you know, if it, if, if there wasn't really technical difficulties, it would be a real conference, you know? <laughs> so, yes. um, yeah, I just, uh, I guess I, I think, you know, maybe go around the room and any last thoughts um, before we end. I, I really enjoyed the conversation with you guys. Um, and I, I like, I hope we continue our Thursday conversations now that my uh, Thursday afternoon chaos has resolved. Um, my last, my last thoughts are just simply that um, as far as an ethical framework, you know, it reflects back on what I was saying earlier We and what Agata was saying. There's no way for the developers, ethics itself is its own area of, of research and asking a, you know, a developer to also take on those, those issues is not, is not possible. It's not, it's not fair. Um, so the question I think we need to be asking is, are we using AI in the right places for the right, the right context to provide the right information? And um, I think I'm not as optimistic as Mariana about, you know, the future of generalized, uh, generalized intelligence. Um, I don't think that we're going to see that in the very near future, but I also don't want us to, because that ends up putting us in a position where we have to rely on the beneficence of this machine and it will have its own drivers. So what I'd rather see us do is develop smaller algorithms for smaller problems that where we can actually understand not how the AI receive, you know, came to its understanding. You know, I don't think explainable AI is the right way to go, but rather the boundaries on its performance. So we understand where it's going to fail, how it's going to fail, and then we can choose to accept or reject an answer that it provides because we understand the likelihood that it's correct. And with that, um, Mariana, do you want to have any last thoughts or Alec? Yeah, uh, I completely agree with you, Julia. And actually, uh, I prefer we to develop a, a complex of services provided by, uh, by AI. And this is idea that is launched by 
Eric Drexler, uh, just to stay at the level of artificial neural intelligence and to use it for solutions in different areas, but not to allow uh, it to develop to artificial general intelligence. Uh, I'm not an optimistic. I, I think I'm realistic because I follow all the singular, singularitarians and Ray Kurzweil, so they, they provide a lot of uh, arguments and and. Uh, proves that it will be achieved, but nevertheless, actually, I prefer to to keep this level and just to improve our this uh, uh, possibility for contribution and for improving our difficulties in different areas, but but not to be uh, in dependence of of uh, this uh, uh, machines and and their completely different logic if we can say logic at all. Uh, so I think this is uh, this is the solution, but at the same time we can control it and at the same time uh, there are a lot of people that are against the regulations and they see that think that regulations are stopping the uh, the progress of AI. So uh, I don't know and this also is uh, uh, connected with the uh, issue of the responsibility and uh, happily and luckily we are starting uh, to discuss this and I think that more people and different stakeholders will be engaged in the future and will contribute for uh, a discussion. I guess I'll just leave my last quick thing. Um... I think the most important thing is just to remember to stay compassionate. Um, AI is changing. Intelligence, by definition, is changing and incorporating new information. We're trying to do as best as we can as researchers, regulators, leaders in the field. And we're, one day, hopefully, we'll get there. And standing up and telling us how we're doing things wrong, how we could do things better is a part of this process. So be compassionate towards AI just in the way that we stay compassionate towards others. Very well said. So um, on behalf of David, uh, thank you um, for attending and I'm uh, I'm glad that I'm glad that we all had this this discussion. I look forward to future conversations. So um, I'm going to David just put a comment in and David says thank you as well. So um, like I said, if it weren't for technical difficulties, it wouldn't be a real conference. So pleasure talking with you all and have a good afternoon.